Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our webinar this afternoon. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes and we do apologise if there's been a slight delay. Just bear with us for a couple more minutes. Thank you for joining us. We're just waiting for everyone to join us. You'll be placed on mute as you join. And we do encourage you to use the Q&A function to ask your questions. We've had a slight change of programme today. Um, one of our presenters, Trish Gallup Greenhow, has to leave at one o'clock. So we're going to switch around uh, the agenda slightly to allow for time for questions. I think we're ready to start. So I'm going to hand you over to Matthew, our chair for today. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, welcome all. Uh, my name is Matthew Wright. I'm a consultant physiotherapist. Um, this is the fourth webinar in our series of change webinars to connect health to make and embed transformation in healthcare. Our last webinar on pain saw 300 people register and today we're not far behind, demonstrating what an important topic COVID rehabilitation is. Today, I will ask each presenter to speak for seven minutes and then open up for a few questions and we will take the majority of questions at the end of the session. We are honoured to have an impressive lineup of speakers and all their profiles are detailed on the web page. To set the scene, rehabilitation, helping people recover from injury and illness to return to what matters in life, has always been a vital if unglamorous and underfunded part of healthcare. But as the world struggles to recover from the grips of the COVID pandemic, rehabilitation has never been more needed. We've all seen the pictures and data from hospitals and ITU beds are at full capacity. We have watched with our tear in our eye as patients leave hospitals to staff applause and guards of honour after protracted inpatient stays. But what next for these people? Although simply deemed as unlucky, otherwise fit and healthy, but now long COVID sufferers. We're starting to see these in our communities. Do they just get left behind and out of sight as the media and nation's interest moves on? We've been proudly clapping our NHS heroes for saving lives, but we need to be equally proud we've made those lives worth living again. This lunchtime, I have a panel of distinguished guests who are going to set the scene and make the case for a comprehensive approach to COVID rehabilitation. My first guest is Dr Emma Lads, General Practice Academy Acad Academic Clinical Fellow from the Nuffield Department of Primary Care and Health Sciences at University of Oxford. Emma will highlight what we mean by long COVID and the implications for primary and community care. I'd like to welcome Emma to speak. Thank you, Matthew. Good afternoon, everyone. So I work in the University of Oxford, um, but I'm also a practicing GP. And it's my job just to set the scene a bit for you by talking about what do we actually mean by long COVID? And what are some of the implications for primary and community care? I've got a few slides just to lay this out. So if we could have the first one, please, Ali. And the first and the most important thing to say is that long COVID um, relies and depends on patients. So it get, gains its name because that's what patients called their own COVID symptoms that hadn't got better yet. And many of them describe this roller coaster journey of experiences and symptoms and encounters with the healthcare system. Next slide, please. And really, we think there's likely to be three main groups of these people. So there's the people who were very unwell to start with, and they were probably in hospital, they were on intensive care, some of them would have been ventilated, and they have organ damage relating from that. And then there's a group of people who were less unwell at the beginning, but they also seem to have evidence of organ damage. And that might be directly related to the virus, so myocarditis or pericarditis, for example, or its complications. Um, so some, some venous thrombolic events or some small vessel disease in, in the brain or the kidneys. And then there's a group of people who seem to have ongoing symptoms and generally weren't in hospital, had relatively mild acute illness, and they don't seem to have any evidence of organ damage using our current investigations. Next slide, please. 
So what's the scale of the problem? Well, the numbers are still debated, um, but our best academic estimates are that between 10 and 20 percent of people who were symptomatic may still be unwell after three weeks and between one and three percent at 12 weeks. And so you can imagine that if you're a typical practice in London or Leicester, which had high, high levels of the disease with 20,000 patients, then actually you probably had up to 2,000 who have had COVID, whether or not they had a positive test. 200 of them probably still needed a sick note after three weeks. 100 probably still weren't quite recovered by 12 weeks. And maybe between 10 and 20 of them are really quite significantly impaired and unable to work or unable to participate in normal daily life. And it's important because although we know it's more common in people with existing health comorbidities or people who were hospitalised, actually all people are susceptible, including those people who were previously fit and healthy and are of working age. Next slide, please. So what symptoms do people get? Well, we know it's no longer just a respiratory disease. It's a multi-system problem. And typically people report breathlessness, severe fatigue and myalgia. They have an exercise intolerance or they get malaise after exertion. But actually there's a whole range of other symptoms as well, including chest pain, heart problems, brain problems, all sorts of endocrine problems, skin rashes, joint problems. Everybody's different um, and everybody's pattern of disease is different as well. Next slide, please. And so what are the implications of some of these issues? Well, it's an emergent new condition. We're still learning about it and there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's currently a lack of good evidence based guidelines and a lack of services to deal with these people. And whilst NICE are busy producing some definitive guidance and there's extra ring fenced funding for development of long COVID services, this is still very much a work in progress. Clearly, management of these people is going to be long term and it's going to be significantly focused around rehabilitation. And an enormous part of that is going to be how do we improve people's function and enable them to get back to work? And bear in mind about the, the slide I presented early on, that actually a significant proportion of people who are affected are young and of working age. Next slide, please. So what sort of things can make a difference? Well, actually acknowledging the condition is very important and, and gives validation both for people um, and individuals, but also for service development. And then of course, education of GPs, but also importantly of all members of the primary care team and professionals who are likely to be dealing with these people. And as I've already mentioned, allied health professionals and occupational health teams are likely to be extremely important. And that goes on to, to thinking about how care needs to be integrated, it needs to be multi-specialty and it needs to be multidisciplinary. It's going to be no good if we just adopt a siloed approach in dealing with these people. And then a return to some good traditional values of care is also important. And talking about therapeutic relationships, so continuity, acceptance of uncertainty and helping people cope with that. And then involving patients at every step from co-design of services to research projects um, and service improvement as well. So it's a challenge and of course it's a challenging context given a global pandemic and an overstretched healthcare system that's likely to become ever more so as it tries to, to deliver the COVID vaccines. But there's an enormous need out there at the moment and it's a need that's really currently going unmet. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, um, before we move into sort of tackling um, the rehabilitation side of it, what, what would your top tips and advice be for clinicians, particularly in primary care, when faced uh, with a consultation with a patient with long COVID? Mm. Well, I think one of the challenges, Matthew, is what I already alluded to, really, that every patient presenting with long COVID can present differently. So I think really listening to the patient and hearing their story 
and not dismissing them. A lot of patients I've spoken to have talked about um, very distressing encounters with healthcare professionals and often GPs where their stories just weren't believed. Um, and some of that relates to GPs understandings or lack of about long COVID itself. And I think that's getting far less so. Um, but a lot of it is is just about actually not listening or giving the time to the patient that they really need. Brilliant, thank you. Right, we'll, we'll, next up we'll invite Professor Trish Greenhow to speak. Uh, Trish is a Professor of Primary Care and Health Sciences and Fellow of the Green College at the University of Oxford. Um, Trish is going to talk about what um, a how we can treat COVID either within existing services or whether there's a need to commission new services. So I'd like to invite Trish on screen. Great, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I, I don't have slides because I sometimes feel people get PowerPointed out, but I've been working with Emma actually. We work in the same department, although I'm no longer what we call clinically active. So I'm unlike Emma, I'm not seeing patients with long COVID. Um, but we did do some research. We interviewed more than 100 people with long COVID and the message is coming out loud and clear that the current services in most places are um, not adequate uh, to meet people's needs. And we came up with, uh, when we analysed the data from, from these 100 or so patients who, who we'd interviewed, um, they came up six principles for a long COVID service. And, and, and we've, uh, in a slightly naff way, we've called them A, B, C, D, E, F. So the A stands for access to services. One of the things that people were quite cross about, and I don't blame them, was that they couldn't access the clinic. They hadn't been in hospital, for example. But, you know, as Emma said, actually a lot of these people don't, don't start with a hospital admission. So the first is everybody needs access to some kind of long COVID service. The second thing, the B in our quality principles is burden on the patient. We need to reduce it. We need to um, make sure that the patient isn't doing lots of work of phoning up, of emailing, uh, of trying to fight their way through the system. It should be really quite straightforward to just come forward and get a referral uh, for the, the kind of rehabilitation that you need. The C in our quality principle stands for clinical responsibility and also for continuity of care, that there should be one person that the patient can say that person is the person caring for me, taking responsibility uh, for, for, for following me up. It doesn't have to be a doctor. In fact, in my view, it would be better if it wasn't a doctor, but somebody in the community um, who, who, who is following the patient through. The D is for the disciplinary in multidisciplinary care. Now, um, many of you are rehab people and you know what multidisciplinary care is about. You know why we need it. Uh, I would say that not everybody with long COVID needs this because if you're on a trajectory where you're getting better, uh, you may not need to be referred for the full package of assessment uh, and tests and personalised treatment. But for those who need it, the, the multidisciplinary option is very important. The E is for evidence based standards. We all know they don't yet exist. Uh, I am on the oversight group of a, a nice rapid guideline uh, group that are developing what I hope are going to be evidence-based standards, bearing in mind that we're building the ship as we're sailing it because this is a condition that hasn't happened before. Uh, so those evidence-based standards are going to actually evolve a bit. It's going to be a living guideline. And the F uh, is for further research uh, that, that it's really important, given the novelty of this disease, that whatever services are set up need to collect data for two purposes. One is to uh, monitor and evaluate the service and, and, and improve the service, but the other is uh, to generate the kind of lessons that we might publish in academic journals as, as research into long COVID. So what we've proposed is a four-tier service. The first is if you like self-management by uh, people with long COVID, uh, some people don't need any 
additional support apart from a website with some good information and resources and videos and that kind of thing. The second tier, uh, which I think is what most people are going to need, which is primary care support, community based rehabilitation, nowhere near a hospital, can actually be quite generic. Uh, the third tier is your specialist assessment and rehabilitation, uh, particularly for patients who've got uh, ongoing breathlessness, severe fatigue, uh, severe interference with daily living. Uh, and finally, the fourth tier is, of course, the care of those very rare but very serious complications, uh, such as the thromboembolic events and things like that. So just to summarise, what Emma did and, and also my little commentary is that from our interview with people suffering from long COVID, there is a desperate need and an urgent need for a rehabilitation service, uh, which operates at various levels, has proper referral pathways, is accessible to patients and where the patient doesn't have to fight their way in. Uh, so I hope that was helpful uh, and I'm uh, going to apologise. I have to leave on the dot of one to join another call, but I'm, I'm around until one. Brilliant. Thank you, Trish. That really followed on really nicely. Um, I, I suppose my initial question about what you've outlined, which sounds fantastic, is uh, do, do you think that the, the current system, the existing services are geared up to provide that? Or do you feel that, that we need to create specialist services to um, do what you've described? Well, there's two things here, aren't there? Because you've, you've, I think you've slightly conflated two questions. One is, do I think the current service is adequate? And, and I think I've already said the patient's saying no. The second is, is the solution to that inadequacy specialist services? And I think I've already answered, not necessarily. There needs to be a specialist rehabilitation service which is staffed by a multidisciplinary team where the patients get, if you like, the full monty of uh, a full assessment, specialist uh, input from people like respiratory physios, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But as a GP, I would also say, uh, and, and I'm also quoting Matthew Knight, um, who uh, Emma and I have published with, uh, he runs the Long Covid Clinic, and says actually many patients do not need uh, advanced tests and in fact should be protected from being sent for lots of scans and blood tests because they're getting better. So we hear a lot about the burden of long COVID and it's an absolutely ghastly disease. We hear less about the people who are getting better from it. Uh, but, you know, as, as someone who practices as a GP for more than 30 years, it's extraordinary uh, what uh, happens when people convalesce. You know, they, 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 they often can just get better by uh, getting back to doing the things that they did before they got ill, if you know what I mean. And whether you're recovering from a hysterectomy or a hip replacement or whatever, um, sometimes all you need is a bit of generic physiotherapy and uh, a link with your GP who sees you every few weeks and, and, and just checks in that you're doing OK. So I think services, both general and specialist, need to be uh, given an injection of resource, actually. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely, it, it does. Um, and it'll be interesting to get Emma, Emma's take on um, what's happening at the moment, because certainly the, the services I work in are, are musculoskeletal rehabilitation services, so we're geared up to rehabilitate people with osteoarthritis, back pain, and postoperatively are being asked um, to start to look at if we can rehabilitate these patients. Um, and it, it, it's I suppose my question within that is what, what is the core skill set that a service would need to be able to rehabilitate these patients and, and probably for Emma as well what what support as a GP does she feel that she needs to complement her skills? That's one for Emma I think because it's it's about current clinical practice. Yes I'll take that one and um, so I think uh, you asked what what's currently happening at the moment as well first and I think the answer is it's very patchy it really depends where you are um, so, for example, where I work, I have a community um, team who are um, two 
uh, respiratory nurses um, who normally work in the community but have a background in critical care um, who recognised that there was an enormous need for people with long COVID and of course being respiratory nurses their focus is mainly respiratory and breathlessness um, so whilst they try and do a, a quite comprehensive um, approach to somebody, a lot of what they offer is um, focused around breathing rehab and they'll be teaching um, exercises to try and help with dysfunctional breathing patterns and that sort of thing. So what could I do within the community? Well, I could really do with somebody who alongside having those sorts of respiratory skills maybe had a more um, general um, training background as well um, and perhaps um, somebody who was able to think a bit more about um, rehabilitation from other specialist settings because I, I completely recognise that this is a new condition for everybody so well we say rehab it's we, we don't have the evidence to really know exactly what sort of rehab would be best therefore we're always trying to extrapolate from our experience of other conditions um, and for example, people who have experience in helping with stroke rehab or other neurological conditions and, and know some of the challenges from that or from people who work with the um, community heart failure teams, for example, I have some very good allied health professionals there who work with patients with quite severe fatigue and, and help them cope with that. So I think my answer is it's not simple and there'll be people coming from all sorts of different backgrounds and we're trying to pull together pieces of a jigsaw nobody's got an easy answer and there isn't going to be a single trained person who's who's there ready to go um, but, but that's really what we need to have. Thank you. Did you want to add anything to that Trish? I think you're mute Trish. Sorry, Trish, we can't hear you. Sorry, the unmute button's doing funny things to me. No, I think Emma answered that very well. I, I have nothing to add to that particular question. Perfect. In that case, I'll ask you a question that's coming up a little bit in the, um, from the audience, and that's about vocational rehabilitation and the, uh, and the role of work. Um, and particularly if there are plans to include that in the guidelines? Oh, I can't talk about the guidelines. I'm not allowed to. I'll take that one. So, <laughs> um, so, I'm in so, as, as a GP, I'm really, really aware of how much of an issue that return to work thing is. Um, yes, I think we very clearly have to include occupational health um, and returning to work as an issue in the guidelines. I obviously don't have any knowledge of what's in them, um, but f from my side, I think that would be one of the, the most important things to emphasise, yes. Brilliant. And, and, and there's a question around the resources that you talked about, Trish, in terms of are, are there signs that the, the, the resources that are needed to set this up are going to be invested? Well, again, um, I'm not any more privy to that than, than anyone else. The only information I have is what's in the public domain. And I think the government has got this five point plan. And from memory, I think this 10 million pounds has been allocated. Um, the trouble with, with sums of money above about a million is none of us can work any of it out. But, you know, it, it, like how many people do you need? I haven't seen the health economics of this. Um, it doesn't sound like a massive amount, to be honest, um, but I don't know uh, is the answer. Someone needs to certainly do the sums and publish what we would get for that 10 million and, and, and which services it's going to go into. Um, and when that's done, I, I rather suspect that some people will be standing up and saying, you know, we need rather more than that. Yeah, and, and actually there's another nice question in the chat which flows nicely into that about what, what do we see the role of the um, the voluntary and third sector being within within this? Well, I mean, maybe we should ask the voluntary and third sector that. But if you remember when I talked about four tiers of service with with um, tier one being what I called self-management and, and using kind of online resources and that kind of thing. 
Uh, I would say that um, the voluntary sector have a really important role uh, to play in that. And I know uh, we've been working with <clears throat> pardon me, long COVID online communities uh, and they're, uh, they're supporting one another in a big way. But also in my local community, I know that there are all sorts of organisations and uh, groups, uh, you know, some of them for um, which are a bit niche. Um, perhaps, you know, some of the ethnic groups, uh, the, the faith based organisations, that kind of thing. I am absolutely sure they are going to be key. Um, whether or not the government's going to give them any money is something going to have to ask the government. But I don't think that was what you were asking me. <laughs> thank you very much, Trish. I'm very mindful of time. So at this point, I'm going to thank, say thank you very much for joining yeah, us. Got to go and, join another webinar at one. Thanks very much, folks. Great, great um, uh, session. Brilliant. OK, our, our next our next speaker is um, Dr. John Etherington, who is the uh, president of the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine and the medical director of Sport, Pure Sports Medicine. Um, due to some technical issues, I, I believe he's going to be joining us via phone. Um, and Dr. Graham Wilkes is a medical director. Connect's going to facilitate that. So I'm hopeful that this technology is going to work. So I'm going to pass over to Dr. Wilkes and Dr. Etherington jointly. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Hi there, John. We can all hear you loud and clear. So if you wanted to um, set out for us what, what you believe that um, a rehabilitation service for um, COVID looks like, that would be really helpful. Yeah, excuse me a minute. There's a bit of a, a tannoy in the background. It'll, I'll go off in uh, 10 seconds. OK, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I apologize, apologies for being delayed. Um, that's uh, technical issues and, uh, and uh, hopefully you can hear what I'm, I'm about to say and uh, miss the opportunity to see my face, which is obviously a, a plus in this situation. So I, I, I've heard a little bit about what's been sp uh, spoken about COVID so far, and I hope I don't I don't cover too much old ground and, and uh, reiterate too much of what's been said. Um, my background is in rehabilitation medicine and rheumatology and uh, my experience it, it comes from predominantly the military and uh, more recently at pure sport medicine as a medical director um, but in the military i had a, a quite a lot of experience in managing unexpected rehabilitation issues if you wish and in particular the, the battle casualties arising from iraq and afghanistan and having an, an and a, a system which was at least present but was not focused on that particular type of rehabilitation need uh, and so i think i have some experience although it's it's in uh, broader terms of rehabilitation and and and, and in particular trauma rehabilitation uh, that that experience lies but i do have some experience in terms of trying to design new systems to fit uh, unexpected need in addition to that, I did a, a short period um, as the National Clinical Director of Art Time for NHS England in rehabilitation and, and that taught me some of the difficulties that we have in terms of trying to get rehabilitation up the agenda, um, in, in particular within the NHS. So the problem clearly is that we have a large number of patients with a, a new condition um, with a potential rehabilitation needs and these needs are complex and I would argue that even people with mild disease may well have complex issues arising from them and we shouldn't just dismiss this as something that can be managed at arm's length by uh, my website advice alone. The complex, uh, complications of uh, COVID are going to be varied and just to make things even more uh, interesting we don't really understand what those complications are and what the long-term impacts are. So we've, we've heard uh, and I've spoken to other groups about the importance of pulmonary rehabilitation in this condition and it's absolutely uh, going to be vital but um, this isn't just a pulmonary condition it's a cardiovascular condition it has peripheral and neuro central neurological effects it causes complex uh, debility uh, I saw a patient last week with quite severe uh, uh, neurocognitive problems and consequently there's, there are going to be mental health issues which need to be addressed in tandem with these. On top of that, um, and what I'm about to say is relatively controversial, uh, but I, I'm going to say it, we have no culture of rehabilitation in, in 
the UK, as far as I'm concerned. To put it in context, in England, we have 950 specialist commissioned beds for rehabilitation, uh, and about 20% of those are set aside for trauma. That's 195. Um, uh, technically not set aside for trauma, but are probably used for trauma. Uh, and again, put that in context, Headley Court in the, in the peak of its dealing with uh, casualties had 195 beds. So there are more beds at Headley Court for trauma than there were for in the, in the entire country of England. And where those beds are focused predominantly on neurological injury and training and, and uh, consultant deliveries is focused in that area as well. In, in addition to that, um, uh, lack of capacity in the system, we have a commissioning structure which arbitrarily um, separates specialised commissioning from community services, from non-specialised services, and that's for the same patient in the same pathway. Um, so I think in that context where we are not used to rehabilitation, to then say, well, we may have, who knows, 40,000, 100,000 people requiring rehabilitation for a disease we don't really understand is is not getting a lot of traction, I would argue, in, in the NHS. And, um, and whereas if you look at other countries, such as Germany, it is accepted. There is a better acceptor, acceptance of rehabilitation being needed for all types of illness and injury, not just neurological. And indeed, there are COVID rehabilitation pathways in Germany, which are commissioned through German uh, health and work insurance. And um, clearly, there's not a lot of evidence coming out of that at the moment, but the, there is evidence that it's being used. And I'm not sure that we're in that particular position. Um, with regard to um, what the UK is doing in terms, or England particularly, is doing in terms of providing for these patients, £10 million has been allocated and a, a document has been produced which is uh, national guidance for post-COVID syndrome uh, and this is for assessment clinics. And now, whereas that's to be welcomed, it doesn't say anything about how that, in fact, that 10 million pounds is not allocated for the rehabilitation of people. It does suggest that these clinics should be there to signpost people to rehabilitation, but if we have no capacity, and in this particular situation, have no capability to deliver rehabilitation, that signposting is not going to be very helpful. So I don't think we, we really have embraced what the need is. I don't think we put the resources that we need to put into it. And uh, I have to say, the last five, six months have been very frustrating in terms of having conversations about this with, within the NHS, um, of raising this to the, the Chief Medical Officer. And although we have a lot of support from the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, where we've discussed this, and uh, the Royal College of Physicians, um, there's a lot of difference between providing guidance and having support, uh, and then operationalising any service. And I don't think we've even considered operationally operationalizing any service. If you're going to provide a service, you've got to assess people properly, and that's going to be multidisciplinary in all elements of medical specialties, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. We need to assess these people properly, and that will require not just expertise, but equipment. And we need to be able to set goals for people and monitor their out outcomes, and when we need uh, those outcomes to be properly measured and vitally important, particularly in the period of uh, that we're in at the moment, we need to be able to use occupation as uh, an outcome. Getting people back to occupation and to paid employment is going to be really important. One thing I would say about mental health issues arising from COVID are going to be important to address. But one thing that frustrates me deeply about our approach to mental health and rehabilitation is that it is no point in treating one uh, without considering the other. You've got to treat the physical conditions and the mental health conditions simultaneously. It's, uh, there's too much, I think, of us thinking about mental health as a separate issue to a physical debility. And there's no point in tr trying to treat depression in a situation in which all of us would be rightly depressed. It need, we need to address the physical demands that the patient has as well. 
fundamentally, I think we don't value the importance of rehabilitation and we need to value that for the individual and for society. And we need to recognize that there is a, pro, a, a proper return on investment for rehabilitation. COVID is one example, trauma is another, but in this case, we are at the uh, critical point in terms of both managing our health of this nation, but also our economy. And we should be looking at trying to get people back to work and reducing the burden on the economy going forward into the future. Other countries such as Germany recognize the importance of this return on invest investment. And every study that's ever been done about it shows a positive return on investment with a ratio in Germany, at least to five to one and higher in other, other nations. Because improving physical and psychological uh, outcomes reduces the cost of medical interventions, reduces the demands that people place on uh, social benefits, reduces social care costs, increases tax and increases, importantly, productivity. It also reduces demand on carer and the economic burden that places on them as well. So I think there is clearly an economic argument to do this. There is clearly a need to do this. And I think the problem is we don't know who to talk to to get this to change. And simply putting a bit of guidance up on a website and activating assessment clinics, I don't believe addresses the full needs of the patients that we see. Um, so that's all I have to say, and I'm happy to take questions if anybody heard any of that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, we, I, I certainly heard you loud and clear, so thank you, John. I'm sure everybody else could as well. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think there's been a lot of agreement in the, the questions and chat around um, saying that you're talking a lot of sense, which is great. I suppose the full on question from that is, and I think it's touched on that a bit, is what, what, what does good look like within a rehabilitation service? Well, I think, again, thinking about my experiences when we had countless battle casualties coming in, one of the big problems is understanding what the medical issues are making a proper diagnosis and we've all heard this is a really complex disease with complications that we don't really understand so you've got to have a medical input to this you've got to diagnose what the issues are you've got to assess these people properly and including looking at you know their oxygen saturations but pulmonary function but also other measurements of exercise tolerance so that we understand this disease better so that we can advise better at the moment we, have, we are giving advice to people based on what we think will probably work, but we don't know. The second thing I would say is that you've got to have a good MDT, and that really goes without saying that within this audience, the strength is in the combination of pro professional expertise. We Nobody can do this alone, and that in includes, as, as we've heard earlier, it, it's not just a pulmonary condition, uh, but it has a really important pulmonary complication. So we need expertise from wide uh, church we've got to you know set goals which the patient wants and manage that outcome and measure that outcome um, and and more importantly valuing outcome uh, return to work being being one of them but not the, not the sole uh, thing that we need to value the one lesson I learned I would say from my battle casualty experience is that we didn't start researching early enough largely because we're too busy um, but our research needs to go in there in now and the fifth and final point I would say is that it needs to be resourced this is not a nice to have we're putting resources in every area of the economy at the moment but not this brilliant thank you John right on that on that note what I'm going to do is now bring in our, our final speaker who is Jack Chu um, Jack is the um, director of MSK Reform, which is a, a grassroots MSK think tank, and he will um, be um, considering the role of rehab recruits and MSK therapists in deploy and uh, supporting COVID rehab. Um, like John, um, Jack is going to be joining us by phone due to technical issues, so hopefully Professor Andrew Walton is going to join us on screen and facilitate Jack to join us as well. So if I can in invite Professor Walton and Jack onto screen, that would be brilliant. Welcome, Professor Walton. We got Jack as well. Jack, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Brilliant. 
Okay, so Jack, can I invite you to to um, give, give us your take on the matter? Absolutely, yeah. Apologies uh, for the technical issues and uh, the unfortunate of not having to see me, but it does mean that I've had a bit of an in and out of the rest of the speakers, so forgive me if I overlap. Um, and certainly I'll try and keep you brief, and then Matthew can maybe fill in the gaps with turning the tables and questioning me. Um, I am a physiotherapist by background in MSK, as well as in, uh, in other capacities. I am a podcaster and interview the best and brightest in the game, also a director of Think Tank, as Matthew described. And in this in this context, we were then at the beginning of the, the sort of COVID situation, uh, I was trying to recognise what it could be uh, that our members, but also the, the wider MSK community and the professions within MSK could do and be optimally placed to, to help society at large with the circumstances we face. Now that means that clinically, I definitely can't speak to the details with regards to long COVID and the sequel of physical and mental health that, that seems to occur specifically within that condition. However, I would, uh, I would say that in an MSK capacity, I was trying to identify what is our skill set and what are the commonalities that could help both COVID patients, especially once outside of an acute setting, and then also what we were calling COVID displaced patients, of which the, their care had been disrupted and their function had been impaired. And the key thing then clinically that was the um, seeming commonality between the MSK professions, namely say MSK physiotherapists, occupational therapists, osteopaths, chiropractors, sports therapists, sports rehabilitators, as well as then many MSK medics even, that what would we be best placed to do? And one of the things that was essentially at the heart of it was, could we scale people's function from where they are to where they want to get to from a thorough assessment that might not be specialised in, say, a pulmonary rehab sense, etc., but in terms of a functional assessment on needs, and then scale people's function wherever is appropriate to them contextually, be that outside of a hospital environment, but by potentially even bolstering community services. Now, I imagine there's some overlap potentially from me and John Edmonton have been in, in quite direct comms earlier on in the year, and so I figured, fear that I might be overlapping somewhat with what he's just said, some of which I missed. But on this, we tried to then pursue how we could, so that was the, that was the sort of theory of it, what are, the, what are the clinical aspects that are common across MSK professions that we could lean into uh, and have shelf, shelf differences uh, where they are existent between those professional disciplines and lean into the commonalities. And then what could we do to try and offer that as a unified workforce? And so one of the things we were able to do fairly uniquely as a think tank is then move quickly and then advocate for policy. And one of the things we moved quickly on was then trying to generate thousands of clinicians across those disciplines I mentioned that would then be willing to sign a register to advocate, sorry, for, for putting themselves forward for that as a policy that we could then present to NHS England, etc., um, to offer those services, which we did. Got several thousands of clinicians that then were saying, I would be happy to be deployed within this context that would maximise my use and skill set. And that was for rehabilitation. Again, not just for COVID, but for COVID displaced patients, but assessing people on individual needs, both in terms of physical, mental and social health needs, and then scaling their abilities in a safe environment. And in doing so, uh, we then submitted that. Um, however, and this is where so I'm talking about the sort of clinical and then what we did operationally to try and get that list together. One of the things and challenges that I'm sure has been discussed thoroughly on this call is that it's not just about what the clinical the clinical needs are, it's not just about what the workforce's clinical abilities are, it then becomes operational and governance based in which, and I suspect, and I think I did hear John touch on this, is that you then encounter the barrier that that's all well and good in theory, but in practice the application of that workforce and the recognition of that clinical skill set does not necessarily either get agreed with by the powers that be and therefore can't be implemented in part because do the powers that be even comprehend what I've just described, which is a scaled functional rehab being at the heart of not just MSK care, but also just generally what, what it means for rehabilitation. So unfortunately, our story with regards to rehab recruits does come, up, does come to a somewhat abrupt end there in the sense that that submission of the workforce list, as well as the application of policy, I then went a little further and suggested what a Nightingale rehab service, call it what you will, would look like, where you could bolster existing community and domiciliary services to ensure social distancing, but also utilise existing infrastructure, physical as well as the workforce, 
And unfortunately, that is something that, for various reasons, the, uh, the, there were decisions to go other ways. So that, as an innovation and trying to advocate under a policy for what MSK clinicians could do, didn't necessarily get taken up. Instead, we didn't really seem to move past, or at least not in the earshot of me, move past the immediacy of trying to find acute and respiratory medical specialists that could bolster acute workforces. I don't feel like we necessarily got out of any gear um, to move into sort of what would be uh, where MSK professionals could better bolster services. And so unfortunately, I don't have anything much beyond a few, a few months ago that could say where we're further along. And that, for me, is in part what John was saying, which is that there is a, continues to be a failure of comprehension of what MSK professionals could use. And one of the examples for that, and I'll finish with this, is that in describing and advocating for what I considered, and our members were fairly supportive of it, thousands of people seem to agree with us and signing up, but when I was advocating for where MSK professionals could be best utilised in, in society at large, including in the private and independent sector, then one of the uh, things that I got back was, you should judge, you shouldn't underestimate how valuable MSK professionals would be in proning teams in ICU because they'd be able to keep an eye on people's manual handling and protect their backs. This comprehension, this miscomprehension of the, the utility of MSK professionals in this way is one of the things that I just don't think we've moved past in the six months worth plus that we've been talking about this. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Um, I suppose my follow-on question from from um, your talk is: you obviously clearly identified a workforce that's available to support COVID rehabilitation, but do do you feel, particularly from what we've heard earlier on the call from Emma and Trish about the complexity um, and the multi-system nature of um, COVID um, and long COVID, do you feel that MSK um, clinicians have that skill set and, and what do you feel is the core skill set that's needed for COVID rehabilitation? Yeah, and, that, and this is where I, I do apologise to, to both you and the audience if it feels like I've spoken past Trish and Emma's pieces because I was only privy to some of them. I didn't hear all of it because of the tech issues, so I'm sorry if that is as if I've spoken past it. But to me, um, I see that there are going to be areas in which certainly would be remiss of MSK professionals to lean too far into stuff that they wouldn't be appropriately specialised in. And, th and I suspect, you know, my, my uh, lack of knowledge as to where we're at with long COVID, particularly their research, is something that, you know, I don't want us to suggest that we could do things that we couldn't. But I suppose when I look at the understanding the sort of broad functional um, issues that seem to occur, that are very individual and I did catch bits where it was saying let's not over you know let's not try to look for patterns where they don't appropriately exist these individual needs are going to be based on as we know the sort of biosocial social and beyond into the holistic factors that affect symptoms then I think that the MSK workforce is certainly in a situation where if it, if it marks its differences I think it's in a very good place to be able to assess and at least triage for the pieces in which we're not appropriate for and that we're always doing that you know it's something that just because there could well be symptoms of long covid or other things that, that may be cropped up we're quite used to recognizing those and it would be um it'd be quite uh, isolating if we were to suggest that because it's not perfect then it shouldn't be done you know we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to how we can best utilize an existing uh, workforce especially if we're appropriately triaging the areas where we're weaker. Um, we're always doing that and cross-referring. So as long as the signposting exists and we're not suddenly reaching into areas in which we're incompetent, then uh, for me, it's, it's something that the heart of functional rehab can still stand. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, I'd quite like to put the same question to um, Emma and John as well, what their views are. So maybe if we start with Emma in terms of, we've he heard from Jack, that there's potentially a workforce available here and we and we've heard from yourself and other speakers that it's quite a complex problem um, but we've probably also identified that there are probably aren't the clinicians out there with those skills as well so how do we bring it all together what's your view emma well, well as i was listening to jack the, the two things that i really um agreed with and, and really resonated for me were that we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good um, and that we all do have particular skill sets and expertise in certain things and there will be some knowledge transference that all of us are able to make. Um, 
So my feeling is that there is a workforce out there. It isn't ideal and it shouldn't mean that we accept that and that we stop advocating for better resources and more more appropriate numbers of, um, of, of workforce personnel. Um, but, but equally, we do need to do something. And if we just wait for the perfect solution, I don't think we'll get anywhere. So I think we have to try and make use of what we have as appropriately as we can at the moment while still doing all the advocating and research that we can to make the case for more resources. Brilliant, thank you Emma. And, and John, what's your take on the matter? Well, I think there's the, the, the workforce out there to, to manage these type of people. I think it's more to do with coordinating their activity and and recognising that this, that not everything can be delivered um virtually or or more more particularly that not everything can be best delivered if um people the professionals aren't working together i, I think there's a, definitely a road for, role for telemedicine and virtual consultations and whatever but uh it shouldn't be seen as the default setting because it's much cheaper and i think you know actually we all know that it's better um for the patient when a multidisciplinary team is working together with them and um it's just about coordinating coordinating that activity and having the facilities to deliver the rehabilitation that they need so i think there are people out there who know what to do it's just about coordinating that and having some direction and strategic direction particularly from 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 the nhs england about how to bring that together but I don't feel that that's at a moment. This is an organisation which NHS England is an organisation which wants to do that. Um, that's your, I think, the biggest stumbling block. It doesn't see its role as a strategic uh, uh, manager of this process. Brilliant. And, and I think a few of the speakers mentioned it, and it, it's a question that's come up in the chat about sort of the coordination piece here. Um, do do the, um, the speakers feel that there's, there's potentially a role for the case management in these situations about um, pulling the resources together, coordinating that care, uh, um, getting the right care in? If we go to Emma first. Uh, yes, very strongly. And that's actually something we've clearly advocated for in our quality. Um, and um, a, a new piece of research that's coming out. I should emphasise I'm not a policymaker or have any policy influence. So the way that we try and make a difference is to produce research off the back of what long COVID patients are telling me and use that to present to commissioners and to other policy leaders. But yes, we feel that's a, a key point. Brilliant. And John? Uh, yes, I, th I think there is a role for that case management um, uh, and case managers. What, what I think is important is that the, 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 <laughs> that this links together real services. You know, it's not trying to find a physio here and a psychologist 20 miles away. It's trying to provide a real service for the rehabilitation of these people and um, uh, and that, that's a challenge. And Jack, do you think that that could work in terms of using the resources you've identified and then using case managers to facilitate that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm very conscious to sound too cynical, really, but unfortunately, it's something that absolutely in practice that is the way to do it. But whether that can, sorry, in practice, I, I'm just concerned again about that. We've, if we've not moved forward with that comprehension of what each of the workforces could bring and we're still doubling down on, on more narrow skill sets, then I don't know how likely it is. I mean, it doesn't stop it being then something that we should still continue to push for so we can sleep well at night, but I just think that that the breakthrough would come from a, an understanding of, of where, where the unifying aspects across professions would be so that we can then um, then make some make some progress on the, on the coordinated efforts. I think that what I've noticed in the chat a little as well is that the, the fact that the model seems to be sort of let's try and have some best practice examples that can crop up locally and then cross our fingers that they then get replicated is something that compared to the rest of the sort of national COVID strategy or lack of is something that therefore you get this, this mix up between 
some of the uh, some best practice examples that might be occurring well, including some recruitment examples that have worked in local trusts or local areas, but the way in which that they can't necessarily replicate rapidly is in part because of the top-down funding that, for, for good reason, became the, the staple because of the energy needs of the country. And so you end up in this situation where, unless there's a persuasion of those in, in, in influence to actually move in line with what we're describing and coordinating it and the case, case management approach that you're describing, then, yeah, unfortunately, I think we end up just posing theory um, and, uh, and, and they're not enacting it. And what what do you think the solution is to that, Jack? I'm keen to hear what 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 do all the panels think? If you if you were a, a commissioner or manager, sort of tasked with addressing your community's needs around COVID rehabilitation, what what would the the steps that you would be taking? So if we start with Jack. Yeah, no problem. I think uh, what what for me would be the, the core of it is to identify instead of instead of having a um, a workforce that is then being considered for redeployment as, as close to their existing role as possible or within a professional cliche of the fact that they want to own the stethoscope, which is what we've kind of found, is that you've then had to look at the workforce and, and delineate it by the profession, of which you've got incredible variety in each of the, especially in the allied health professionals. There's been some assumptions then made, and, and that's where some of the mistakes have occurred, is that either on redeployment or in restructuring, it's been leaning into stereotypes or even misconceptions um, instead of the identity, identity as I described it as being that this, 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 uh, this commonality across the professions I mentioned before, but even outside of MSK, you've got other, other professionals, other professions that overlap significantly. So if it's, instead of thinking about it under professional guises and cliches and what they were once taught at university, many years ago, instead if you think about what the sort of heart of the care delivery mechanism might be, as I mentioned, in MSK advocate for functional scale graded individualised rehab, then if we did that and we then replicated that across other areas, then for me, you build policy around that. You kind of put some parameters around what the, that service may or may not do. And then so, you know, you try and stop um, stop any sort of professional tribalism taking hold. You create policies and parameters of what this service is doing and, and have competent clinicians working within those parameters. And I would say you distribute that virtually, you do community services, you try and get people and keep people out of hospital um, in the COVID safe manners in which we're all going about clinical practice now. You deal in and involve other resources, be that, be that larger centres, be that private clinics, independent sector and third sector charity organisations have been incredibly infused by what we were doing with rehab recruits. But again, it was, we were guilty of being all taught, because what are we? We're a very small and relatively young think tank that were then posing ideas when actually we were all crossing our fingers that, that the powers that be listened. And yeah, we didn't win that argument. Thank you, Jack. Emma, what, what would be your advice to the sort of commissioners and managers trying to set up these services? You're on mute, Emma. Sorry, I, I think Jack's right in that you, you should start with the service rather than the workforce. And I think very clearly you need to specify exactly what the aims of your service are, what it's trying to achieve and what outcomes you're going to use, like John mentioned earlier, to, to measure success of that. I think it has to be, um, although you should have um, a national agreement about what sort of services, what sort of principles should guide your service, actually every locality is going to have different assets and be able to do it differently. So I think it does have to be locally determined. Um, and it may well be that actually your service ends up being a mixture of virtual and face to face. I think that's that's essential and distributed between the community and secondary care. Um, but I think the way that that interface and the coordination happens has to be very carefully managed. And the way you do that is, I think, through having very clear lines of clinical responsibility and whether that's a, a case manager or whether actually it's um, to, to have a transfer mechanism. So we have a lot of shared care between primary care and secondary care specialists, for example. And I'm obviously not a rehabilitation specialist. I don't know much about the, the different specialties and, and the different distributions of the workforce. So I can really only speak from my 
experience as a GP, but the shared care model in primary care tends to work quite well. Um, so I think that, that would be my way forward to have national service specifications, but actually locally determined um, in collaboration with everybody who's going to be responsible for delivering them ultimately. Thank you, Emma. And John, your take on or advice to commissioners and people setting up services? Well, I mean, there, are, there, there is uh, national commissioning advice brought forward from NHS England recently. Um, and that talks about assessment clinics and it also talks about where the funding stream will come from to set up these assessment clinics. Um, it, it, it's a little uh, light on operational detail. Uh, it does say something about what good looks like. It doesn't really tell me how you are going to access the rehabilitation assets that you need to for these people. Um, um, but, but, but there is a first step in what the assessment clinic should look like and where, where the money can come from to support that. So what I would hope is that commissioners um, recognise that this isn't just a, going to be an extension of pulmonary rehabilitation or cardiac rehabilitation or anything we've ever done before. It's, it's going to be a bit more complex than that and, and it needs much wider engagement with, with different specialties to get a good outcome. Great, thank you. Um, and, and Kathy's just asked a great question in chat, which brings me back to Emma's excellent point within her talk about patient and public involvement. Um, so I'll start with Emma because she was the first one to raise it. How, how do we get the patients and public involved in setting up these services? You're on mute again, Emma. Sorry, I've got some echo in the background. So um, the way I've been trying to do it with my team is by working with long COVID patients um, during our research projects to try and get their views and experiences and and work with them to help um, gain a, an, an appreciation of what would have been better for them. Um, and then I mean, that that's and we've been recruiting through online media and um, through social media and we're obviously um, only getting a, a proportion of the patient views um, with long COVID. So we'd like to very actively try and um, speak to people um, from people who are um, less likely to come forward often. So people with mental health problems, for example, or in less, um, less um, uh, well off or less um, pe people who are less engaged um, and try and work with them further um, in our research. But I think um, when we're commissioning services, we need to try and reach out to, to other patient groups as well in the same way. Thank you. And just to follow up on that question, because somebody asked it in the chat earlier, which was really pertinent. We know that um, black and ethnic minorities are often um, a bit more affected by um, COVID for various reasons. How how do we reach out to those communities and make sure that they're included, but also get the rehabilitation they need? Because historically they don't. Absolutely, and and that's one of the main groups that we've really struggled to reach for our initial pieces of research. Um, we've tried to do it by specifically recruiting those kinds of of individuals through um, social media, and that helps a bit. But I think then going out to the community, so working with local community leaders and um, some faith leaders can be help helpful in that. Um, but also um, lo just local community um, leaders who tend to be quite well known um, or participate um, in, um, uh, for example, in PPG groups in local practices. Um, that's that's how we're planning to, to try and do it further. Brilliant, thank you. John, have you have you got any take on um, how we can get patients and public more involved in these services? Nothing much more to add to, to Emma's comments, really. I think she's just sort of hit the nail on the head there. And I think that the, the uh, BAME group is, is often very difficult to, to target, but I think she absolutely has the right approach. And um, particularly looking at uh, engagement through community leaders. Thank you. And Jack, I know it's a subject close to your heart. Have you got any uh, advice on getting sort of expert patients involved in it? 
It is, yeah. I mean, very passionate about coal production. And what's interesting about when I speak of, uh, as a director of MSK Reform, we're, we're very much across all interested parties, including patients, carers, other non-professionals within other industries that, that care about MSK Reform and, and practice within it. And therefore, um, I don't want to make sure I agree wholeheartedly with what I must said, but also flag a few points of interest where there are certain, uh, certain circumstances where uh, patient involvement and engagement, especially in infrastructure and hierarchy within trusts and organisations, where it had made some progress, and then there are areas where um, the involvement of patient voice and patient narrative, and especially in governance structures, unfortunately when COVID struck, it highlighted a sort of tokenistic approach to things when I heard of three examples in which patient directors and paid patient advocates who were leading on networks within organisations were actually suggested that the, their organisation were trying to look into whether they could furlough them at the time. It was this notion that actually, okay, you know, this is this is uh, this is serious work, and therefore this plaything that we did where we were involving that side of things is suddenly being superseded by important stuff. And it just for me highlighted the way in which we need to make sure that these things are done properly and not just paid lip service to. And so I know that, uh, you know, I've nothing further to add in terms of how I think that they have nailed that, uh, but certainly one for me it would be just to, to not just uh, notice it happening, but also follow through and make sure that these voices are not just given parity, but also the priority where appropriate for us to make sure that we're uh, understanding the, concert, uh, the circumstances that surrounding the way that this is affecting them. Uh, both in their health and also you know, the sequelae in mental health and social factors. Mm. Matthew, may I add a point to that? Sorry, I really wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think tokenism is one of the really big challenges for everybody who tries to um, to involve patients in either service development or research. And I think um, ongoing um, involvement, so this isn't just a one-off thing, this isn't just a, what do you think now about X? It's an ongoing iterative process. And I actually think giving ownership to patients um, as co-members of the team can be a really important way of trying both to validate what they're doing, but also to, to really emphasise they are doing something really meaningful. This isn't just tokenism. This is this is something that's actually really contributing and um, is really important. But I absolutely agree with with the importance of guarding against it. Brilliant. Thank, thank you all. I think that feels like an appropriate point to end end the session on where we're finishing with the patient voice and role, which is where we should start and finish. Um, so all that remains to me really is to thank our um, expert speakers from the session lunchtime. Hopefully the audience got a lot out of it. Um, apologies for the technical issues we experienced, but I think we managed to to get all the voices heard and to um, get across some really valuable points. Um, so thank you very much all. Um, just to bring your attention, this is a, a one of in a series of um, webinars which um, we've been running and our next webinar is on AI triage and digital transformation of patient care. We're then also looking at mental health which has come up today, quality improvement and the nice pay, pay, low back pain guidance, uh, nice pain guidance even. Um, so please do join us for future webinars if this has been of interest. Um, all of those are on our website and advertised via social media. So um, please do join us. Please give us feedback. And um, it, it's all about trying to learn together and push healthcare forward. So thank you to all and have a great day.